this is a, uh, um, uh, a study by PhD student Michael Wybrands, who is back in Australia at the moment, um, acknowledging our other co-author, Hugh Riddell, as one of um, uh, Michael's co-supervisors. And uh, this is really a, a work in progress um, sort of topic, uh, looking at incidents of stereo blindness um, as part of a larger um, VR distance perception study. Um, so this is a little bit of an introduction into the study that's taking place and some initial results just in terms of the uh, stereo blindness results. Um, so um, just a little bit of background for, for those who might be just um, new to the field. Um, stereoscopic vision, also known as stereo vision or stereopsis, is the ability to perceive the depth of objects based on visual cues provided by our binocular visual system using binocular disparity. Um, stereo impairment is the partial dysfunction of stereoscopic vision, um, usually in a subsystem such as uh, convergent or disp uh, divergent disparities or coarse or fine disparities. And stereo blindness is generally described as the total absence of stereoscopic vision, so the ability, inability to fuse the stereoscopic, uh, the two views. Um, causes of stereoscopic vision. Um, um, can relate to poor correlation between images from both eyes during early visual development. Um, amblyopia, which is a condition where the vision in one or both eyes is significantly impaired, and strabismus, um, a condition where the eyes are misaligned and don't align on the same object at the same time. Um, um, stereo blindness has a range of impacts, uh, particularly um, relating to um, uh, motor coordination uh, for visually guided tasks such as hand to object movements, operating vehicles, navigating stairs, for example, um, or uh, um, some ball sports. Um, technology uses binocular disparity to create an artificial sense of depth is limited or even detrimental, um, um, uh, such as 3D film and television and, and VR headsets. So um, um, for that purpose, for the, the VR user study that we've um, been conducting, we, we do test the users, uh, the subjects of our um, study um, for stereo blindness. Now here are two tests. One of these was just mentioned in Bonnie's presentation. Um, and the one on the left um, has the limitation that it has... Um, several monocular cues and therefore it can be um, still seen by someone with, with stereo blindness. Uh, they can still respond uh, as if they have stereoscopic vision. And so the one on the right was uh, released subsequently to try and alleviate those problems. And you notice the, um, the images on the right hand side of the yeah, here's my laser pointer, here we go. Uh, on the right hand side of the right hand unit has a series of random dot stereograms which are much better at um, um, only revealing themselves to people with stereoscopic vision. Um, here is the anaglyph glass Im image. If you haven't got a, a pair of anaglyph glasses, um, Eric will bring them around for you. Just raise your hand and Eric will bring them up. Um, so this is, this is only one slide in the whole presentation that's stereo. So I'll just linger on this a little bit longer. Um, this is a view of the, um, the Hive, which is the, uh, the visualisation facility at Curtin University, which I manage. And this view shows two of our displays, the cylinder display on the left and the wedge display on the right. Uh, the cylinder is a three metre high, 180 degree field of view display um, and um, has an eight metre diameter. Um, and the display on the right is the wedge display, which is two rear projected panels uh, mounted at 90 degrees. Both of those systems can operate in stereoscopic mode. And um, routinely when we do um, uh, demonstrations in the hive using the 3D glasses, uh, which are active 3D glasses on the, both of these systems. Um, we use a random dot stereogram um, to test for stereoscopic vision, but that's mainly due to um, with the motivation of wanting to test the glasses. So the, um, 
the glasses are battery operated and sometimes the batteries go flat or sometimes the glasses stop operating. So we use a random dot stereogram to just confirm that everything's okay. So we just get to people to say, hey, um, you know, no, I can't see a, um, the, the, there's usually a number hidden in the, uh, the image there. Um, um, this is only a stereo image in terms of seeing in the environment, but um, I haven't coded them for uh, viewing the random dot stereogram with your anaglyph glasses there, so um, it's not a, a full test. Um, um, and uh, you know, we just ask them to raise their hand if they can't see the number in the random dot stereogram, and then we swap out the glasses, and that usually fixes things. But we do notice that from time to time there are people who um, have... Um, um, presumably stereo blindness because we test the glasses that they've given to us back as not working and they are working so we just give them another pair and um, sometimes we'll mention that you know sort of a small a, um, uh, I usually say 5 to 10% of the population can't see in 3D so um, you know that's, that's probably what's happening here Um, now, in terms of the prevalence of stereo blindness, there was a very interesting paper by Choppin um, in 2019, which reviewed um, uh, previous studies on stereo blindness um, between 1970 and 2016, which found that um, um, on the basis of these previous studies, 7% of the population under 60 years, years old is stereo blind. Now, it was our informal um, sort of uh, um, assessment that when we've been doing these um, random dot stereogram tests in the hive that um, uh, the incidence of stereo blindness of visitors to the hive was much less than this 7% figure. Um, and you know, possibly as low around as around 2%. So we're sort of keen with this study that was being conducted by Michael to um, um, look at those figures and see whether, you know, um, there has been a change with, um, over time with, you know, quality of eye care and um, uh, people's knowledge of 3D movies and hence wanting to improve and, or, you know, test their stereoscopic vision. Um, so, um, yeah, so we wanted to, uh, to do that. As part of this, which is the primary role, um, is a, the VR user study. Um, so as part of Michael's PhD, um, he's conducting three user studies to determine the impacts of adding a realistic environment around photogrammetry 3D models of showing um, shipwreck um, 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 environments. Um, in a virtual reality based underwater virtual heritage experience. I'll show you some examples of those images in a moment. So the very first user study that we've, um, that Michael's performed um, is aimed at whether um, marine snow and light attenuation improve distance perception in underwater virtual heritage experiences when viewed in a virtual reality headset. We've been using a um, Oculus Quest 2, or sorry, a MetaQuest 2, um, and as part of that study, we screen all of the participants with that Randot um, uh, stereogram test I showed you a few moments ago, and those who fail the stereo test um, aspect are excluded from the study. We'll let them continue with the study because they've you know, sort of fronted up, etc., but they're excluded from the results. So um, here's an example of the um, the type of environment that they are shown um, and um, you know, we're particularly um, interested in visual accuracy um, so this is the, the virtual environment that they're seeing um, what this shows is a section of a wreck site that we surveyed in 2018, this is the wreck of the HMAS AE1 which was a, a World War I submarine that sunk off the coast of Papua New Guinea and we surveyed that in 2018. And uh, this is the, the stern or the back end of the, the submarine. You can see the two propellers here. And you know, this is a, um, a, th um, a virtual envir environment using a, a digital 3D model that's been calculated and um, 
um, reconstructed using photogrammetry techniques um, from about 8,000 photographs. And here's one of the actual photographs themselves. Um, so this is you know, a, a full photographic image. And what you can see in this image is you know, the, the, the close accuracy between the visual look of those um, two images, this one being a still from the virtual environment and this one being an actual image from the, uh, the wreck site. You can see the marine snow in the, um, in the scene there, and marine snow is just sort of small debris just floating in the water, um, and also the light attenuation. So as you move further away, um, light gets attenuated, particularly the red part of the spectrum gets attenuated very quickly, and as a result, they just disappear into the murky depths. And Michael has reproduced both of those things in the virtual environment with the aim of saying, is that actually of any use to understanding um, sort of uh, perceived distances and depth in the virtual environment? Um, this is another view of the virtual environment and there's a range of different controls. Um, you're able to change the type of sky. In this case, it's, it's light, but... Um, Usually it would be dark. Type of um, um, uh, sea floor or ground. Um, which particular rec model we're using. We've, we've um, reconstructed and, and calculated several different versions. Um, uh, whether it's full scale or at a model size, um, there's a range of presets for the whole thing. Um, and um, you can also set the type of lighting used in the scene. Um, uh, sound and also dynamic effects such as the light attenuation and the types of marine snow that are shown in the virtual environment and here it shows the controllers that are able to pick and click those various controls. Um, so in this first user study we've had 81 participants. Um, these participants have come from the student population at Curtin University. Um, the average age of the participants is 21. Uh, 21 males, 59 females, and 1 9 binary. Um, and now some of these interim results. Um, the participants were classed as stereo blind if they failed one or more of the four random dot stereograms with the largest disparity in, a, in, the, in the random dots, the ran dot stereo test, which I showed you earlier. Um, a total of four percent, sorry, four out of the 81 participants um, failed one or more of the, the stereograms and classified as stereo blind, which comes up as roughly five percent. Um, uh, two more studies are planned, and, and that will expand upon this testing. But uh, five percent is pretty close to seven percent, and it's you know much more than our just our in, um, informal guess at roughly. 2%. Um, so the results of this study so far are higher than our informal testing, which may reveal that um, there's more people attending our demonstrations who are actually stereo blind than we realise. They may not just be saying, you know, they might just not be putting their hand up to say, oh, this is not working. Um, there may actually be some unidentified issues with our custom stereo test. Perhaps. I think it's more likely that people just aren't saying so. Some people are, you know, um, quiet and don't want to sort of, you know, make a, make a scene. Um, um, and the study results are slightly lower than um, the 7% figure I mentioned earlier. Um, this might be due to the low age of the participants in this study and it is known that prevalence increases with age. It might also be the number of participants um, is, is relatively low at this point, so there may just be some statistical variation there. Um, but as we um, conduct the further two studies, and we'll be doing the, the same test, um, it's unlikely the same participants will be um, um, repeated, but if they were, we won't be including them in this, these stereo blindness tests. But um, as we continue the study, um, then that uh, will hopefully provide better reliability. Um, one thing I was wanting to mention is that um, uh, when we do notice people are stereo blind and if they you know, show an interest in, in knowing more, we point them to this book, which is by Susan R. Barry, 
Um, so attended the conference um, many years ago um, and uh, wrote a very good book called Fixing My Gaze, A Scientist's Journey into Seeing in Three Dimensions. And she was um, diagnosed as stereo blind as a child. She had, I think it was strabismus, um, had corrective surgery but never did anything good for her. And then in her 40s, something was going on and um, she went to see an opt... Op, uh, sorry, a... Oh, I forget the type of uh, vision um, specialist that was um, she went to, but um, she was able to gain stereoscopic vision in her mid-40s. And she wrote a book about that. And um, so we, we point people who um, um, we find uh, stereo blind towards this book, and that, that may be of, of interest to them going forwards. Mm -hmm.